Hello, everyone. My name is Jordan Alt. I'm a partner in Hush Blackwell's Jefferson City, Missouri office and a co-chair of our firm's nonprofit organizations and religious institutions team. I want to thank you so much for joining our program today. Before we begin, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your audience console, there are multiple application icons for your use during the program today. If you have questions during the webcast, please submit via the appropriately named question box. We'll try to answer those during the webcast today. If a fuller answer is required or it's a little specific, we may uh, follow up by email. All materials for this presentation are available in the program materials folder. And because five of you will ask, it's just the slides. You can find them there. Uh, the program has been approved for legal education hours. So to report your hours, click on the CEU icon at the bottom of the screen. A certificate of attendance, including course numbers, will be emailed to you tomorrow, along with a recording of the webcast, which you can share far and wide or rewatch as many times uh, if, if we really knock it out of the park. And toward the end of the program, be sure to complete our short survey. We really do read and use those. Actually, this topic came from a survey from the last um, a nonprofit and church related webinar that I did. Um, so let's start with introductions. And I will also preface this by saying two thirds of us are sick. Um, the good news is I was 100% certain uh, that yesterday was the worst day of my head cold. The bad news is apparently I am terrible at estimating head colds. Um, so I will make liberal use of the mute button so you're not hearing me coughing. Um, Again, I'm Jordan Alt, so I, I split my time at the firm in uh, general litigation and then working a lot with nonprofits and specifically with religious clients uh, across all faith backgrounds. A majority of my work is with the Missouri Conference of the United Methodist Church. So I will shout out to all of the litany of First United Methodists of blank that I saw uh, in the attendee list today. Presenting with me, I'm really excited, two of my very favorite colleagues, Michaela Hennessy and Alex Rushing. Alex counsel schools on investigations, litigation, and compliance matters arising from a wide range of harassment, discrimination, and safety issues. These include advising on claims following alleged student or employee misconduct uh, involving criminal activity, and sex, race, age, and national origin discrimination. She works closely with institutions, spending time in schools, conducting interviews and trainings to preemptively isolate potential challenges and design measures to address and promote a healthy, inclusive, and safe environment. She invests time to build strong relationships with clients so she can understand their individualized risks and craft solutions that are right for them. Um, she's done a million of these. If you are in the education, um, side of things. You Maybe you've been to a few webinars that she's done. And I'm also pleased that as of January 1 um, on this slide, she will receive a promotion to partner. So if you work with Alex, be sure to congratulate her. And as a labor and employment attorney, Michaela Hennessy guides employers through the nexus of managing employees and workforce regulations. She understands that labor and employment law with workforces keeping businesses moving can be especially sensitive, complex, and detailed. So preparedness, compliance, policies, and training can be critical components heading off problems before they develop. Michaela monitors fast-moving local, state, and federal guidance for employers so that she can guide the implementation of best practices uh, for employers. One of the things that I will say about Michaela is she has worked with me on any number of employment matters involving nonprofits and specifically churches specifically with that, uh, preschool teachers and other teachers within churches. So the good news is I get to work with Michaela a lot. The bad news is it's because you, you, know, you all out there have a lot of issues that we need to work with you on, which is why we're here today. Uh, <clears throat> so one last thing, you will hear me uh, talking about uh, preschools. Please know that when I say preschools, it could mean children's or parents day out. It could mean after school care. It could mean elementary schools. I'm just focusing on preschools because that's what we see in a lot of the religious clients I work with. And also, I will reference churches, religious clients, faith communities. Almost all of this, with a few exceptions that we'll, we'll note, will be uh, equally applicable to, uh, to general nonprofits. Just so you're aware who's out there, seems like about two-thirds of you work with churches or faith communities. About a quarter of you are with nonprofits or colleges, universities, public school systems. And about 10% of you are here for the free CLE credit. And regardless of why you are here, we are glad that you are joining us. So let's go ahead and get started. 
Um, I'm going to start today by talking about some practical considerations uh, that, that you'll need to consider either if you have a preschool in place at your church or nonprofit, or if you're considering doing so. Alex is going to jump in after that to talk about education-related considerations, and then Michaela is going to, uh, to follow up to talk about employment guidance, specifically a little bit about something that we've talked about in the past, which is the ministerial exception for teachers working with um, faith communities. So practical considerations. <clears throat> I will tell you that I spend a lot of time working with other, what, what we in the United Methodist uh, uh, background call chancellors, which are, is a fancy, ridiculous word for outside counsel. And I've had a lot of conversations about how legal issues involving church preschools and church schools and church childcare have been keeping us up at night. So I wanna start by basically just saying, um, you know, why is that? So a couple things you need to know, number one, uh, preschools and education uh, at churches and nonprofits, you're working with a high risk population. Children uh, many times can't speak for themselves. They're particularly susceptible to abuse or injuries. So there's all kinds of potential problems there. There are questions of governance and control about who operates, who runs, who has oversight over, um, over the preschool or school. There's a lot of employee turnover. And I think Michaela will tell you that we've seen that uh, a, a big rise in that since about 2021 or 2022. Um, there's always real estate and building maintenance issues. A lot of churches uh, or nonprofit buildings just weren't made to, to host preschools. Um, the next one seems a, seems a little rough, but it's very true. Aggressive parents. Uh, I have had cases where parents have threatened litigation, have served subpoenas on our teachers, seeking documents or testimony. Um, I just didn't see that a few years ago, and, and it's become a trend that we're, we're seeing more and more. There are political concerns, both internal within a church or nonprofit and external about education in general. There can be complex policies, certification and training. There are tax issues that sometimes pop up. So why are you gonna do it? Well, because it's a great ministry of a church. It's a great, oftentimes it goes hand in hand with the, the mission of a nonprofit. A lot of times churches have space available Monday through Friday. Uh, there's, there's a lot of good that can be done and a lot of reasons why organizations participate and host these uh, kind of programs. So at the beginning, if you have one of these uh, organizations in place at your church or nonprofit, or if you're considering it, I want you to ask yourself a few questions. Is your preschool a ministry of the church or nonprofit or is it separately incorporated? Who's on your board? How are they elected? Are your preschool funds kept separate from your general church or nonprofit accounts? Do you have a personnel or employee handbook? And is, do you have one specific to teachers? Um, is a contract in place for use of your building by the preschool? And then do you have policies in place for things like combating sexual abuse, vaccinations, parent complaints, investigations? Um, we're gonna be talking about those throughout the next hour or so. I wanna start with the biggest one, and it's a question that I get a lot, which is, if we want to start a nonprofit, do we incorporate it separately as a nonprofit corporation? Or do you just want to fold it into the nonprofit or into the church itself? Um, so ask yourself those questions. Is our, not, is our preschool separately incorporated? Do we have its own board? Uh, do we follow all the corporate formalities? Is there a lease agreement in place? Uh, and then if you're contemplating, ask, do you want a separate 501c3 nonprofit corporation or do you want to operate it as a ministry of the church? So to see if people are paying attention, we're going to start with a poll. How is your preschool or child care program structured? A, it's incorporated as a separate entity. B, it operates within the corporate structure of the church or nonprofit. C, we don't have one. Or D, I'm not sure. And I will say D might seem a little much, but I talk to a lot of folks from churches and uh, D comes up quite a bit. So hopefully you all, oh, I see. Uh, we just upgraded our, uh, our presentation software and I see votes coming in, which is exciting. We never used to see this live, uh, but now I can tell you that you are actually voting. So we'll give it just a second or two to kind of get a sense of who's out there. Let's see, about half of you have voted, so I'm just gonna click ahead and see. All right, 
it looks like for 43 percent of you almost half of you it uh you have a preschool that operates within the corporate structure of the church or the nonprofit, um <clears throat> which is interesting i'll be honest i thought a and b would have been uh, flipped based on conversations that i have so let's talk about why i get this question a lot if we want to start a preschool should we incorporate it separately and basically i say there are three ways to do things two of them are okay the first is to incorporate separately um, the second is to just operate the preschool or child care within the structure of the church or nonprofit. And the third, and at the risk of sounding un-PC and perhaps a little sexist, I call the little old lady model of church preschools. And I say that just because as I was growing up, every preschool I went to after every school, after, um, after school care program was run by a woman who seemed at the time to be about 140 years old. And as I've grown up, I realized they're probably in their mid forties. Um, and as I talk with churches, a lot of churches still have that model. There is a woman many times that's been doing this for 30 or 40 years that is still doing it. And they are wonderful and saints of the church. Mine was Betty Rademacher. She oversaw all of this at our church and was a central point in my faith development. But as things get complicated, having one person run everything without oversight uh, can be problematic, which is why I always suggest you go with one or two, separately incorporate, or actually operate it within the church, but make sure you have uh, oversight put in place. So what, what's the benefits of incorporating it separately? The, the gold standard, number one with a bullet here, is liability protection. If, if a student gets injured, if there's an abuse claim, if you are running the um, faith community and the preschool as separate entities, and you're doing it right, that liability is going to stick with the preschool and not uh, not with the church. And that's critical because as I said, these are high risk endeavors. And so cutting off that potential liability is why most people incorporate separately. Uh, number two, there's streamlined control and governance. You know who does what, and it's easier to segregate funds. Each entity has its own board. They're elected. They have their own uh, bank accounts. However, there are some costs. There's additional administrative work. There's a threat of loss of control. If you have a separately incorporated entity and later they decide, you know, we don't really like the theology of the church, we're gonna go do our own thing. You know, on one hand, you may say, great, we're putting this ministry out in the world. But on the other, you've invested a lot in that ministry and it may not wanna be part of the church anymore. There's always that risk. And then there's a possibility of uh, conf uh, confusion uh, that some people might not associate the preschool with the church or faith community, which is something that you may, uh, you may want to do. Again, either one, one or two, there's no wrong answer. Um, I typically say if a, if a faith community is larger and has the administrative capability to handle the two separate ones, as long as you're segregating funds, at least as long as you have separate boards, it's a smart move to make, but it's not mandatory. What is mandatory is the next slide here, policies. And we could spend hours and hours on this, we're not going to, but what I want to do is just get your brain working about thinking, do you have these in place? Do you need them in place? Um, so let me point out a few policies that you should have. Number one, again, number one with a bullet is protections against sexual abuse. In the United Methodist context, uh, we use a program called Safe Gatherings that'll say about how, uh, how many adults need to be in a room with children, uh, permissible touch, things like that. Um, you, it, it, it's essentially mandatory. If you are working with young children, you need to have a policy in place to prevent sexual abuse. Uh, a policy for protection against injuries, policies for food allergies, safety and building access, vaccinations and medical issues, which as you can imagine in the last two years have popped up quite a few times. Parental pickup. This is something that I've been surprised by where mom and dad are going through a divorce. Uh, dad's always picked up the kids, dad picks up the kids and all of a sudden mom calls the police. Sometimes the church has known dad shouldn't pick up the kids. Sometimes they have no idea. And then the police come and everybody's hair is set on fire. So having a policy in place for who can pick up and how to change that is critical. Uh, investigations and reporting when there are claims of abuse or, or known abuse or injuries. And then particularly with um, preschools, children stay out and young kids, uh, bathrooms and, and diapers. Uh, if if uh, teachers are uh, working with children when they're in a particularly vulnerable area, um, you should have policies in place for how that works. Now, I will say, not every church is gonna have all of these, not every preschool, not every nonprofit is gonna have all of these. So here's the golden rule when I put on my litigator hat. 
The only thing worse than not having a policy in place is having a policy that no one follows. If there's one thing from my section you can take away, let it be this. If you have these policies in place, great, that's critical. But here's what you need to do. Write them down, provide training, document the training so you know everyone who's going to be working with children has gone through that training. Follow the policies <clears throat> and share them, not only with staff, but with parents. And sometimes that can be critical. I'll give you an example. I uh, used to volunteer at my church nursery, and uh, I remember one time I was there with four preschoolers or so working with a woman who'd been volunteering there for 20, 30 years, and she leaves and says, I'm going to go get a cup of coffee. And it hits me that I'm alone with four kids for about five minutes. And even though I know all this stuff, even though I train on this stuff, it was hard for me to take the step to say, hey, that's really not cool. We have a policy in place. You shouldn't be doing this. So making sure that there is an environment where enforcing these policies uh, is, is critical. That, that has to happen, and I'm as guilty as anybody else about that. Uh, generally, some issues about safety for you to consider, whether you have a preschool or not. The biggest thing is building access. I can't tell you the number of times I've visited a church or faith community I'm walking through, and without any locked doors, I'm walking right by student classrooms. I know you can't lock out or segregate that area in every church, but you ought to be doing as much as you can to make sure that area is segregated from the general population when school is in session. Generally, clear visibility into rooms. If you have kind of the bifold doors or doors with glass uh, or leaving doors open can be critical. Um, two adult requirement in classrooms, background checks for teachers and volunteers, accident prevention, like furniture that is um, up against the walls, uh, outlet covers, things like that. I will say from personal experience, um, uh, coffee pots and coffee machines with cords that dangle down are a problem. Don't have coffee pots with cords that dangle down. It's terrible. Uh, drop off and pick up, not only who's doing it, but making sure you're doing it in a safe way. Compliance with building and fire codes, communication plans, safety personnel in churches and, and faith communities. We've seen this pop up more and more, uh, particularly with the firearms policy. Some churches have safety personnel that are there when school is in session. Some of them they are, uh, they are carrying. Making sure you know at the preschool level how that works and the um, interaction between the faith community or nonprofit safety personnel and the impact that they have and the interaction with the, uh, with the school is gonna be critical. <clears throat> uh, investigations. If you run a preschool or childcare long enough, there will be allegations made that need to be investigated. I get a lot of calls uh, where somebody calls and say, hey, the police just showed up there's been an allegation against one of our teachers or volunteers, what do we do? And the first thing I say is, thanks for calling, that was the right move, but also comply with law enforcement and state officials. The worst thing, and I hate when people do this, and other people may suggest otherwise, but when police show up and you slam the door in their face and say, we're not doing anything until we talk to, their, talk to our lawyer. Talking to your lawyer is a very smart thing to do, but also cooperating and complying with those investigations is pretty important. Um, Consider mandatory reporting requirements. You have them in your state. It depends on the state, but you should be training your uh, staff uh, on when to hotline issues. If there's an allegation made, I always suggest you need to remove the subject of the complaint from interaction with students. That could be putting them on leave, could be taking them out of a classroom, whatever needs to be happened so they aren't around students as the investigation takes place. If you are doing an investigation yourself, it needs to be documented. It needs to be documented carefully. And I always say just the facts, ma'am. It can't be your, you know, that so-and-so seemed shifty or anything like that. It needs to be the facts of what you document. But other than that, I don't want you communicating in writing because what happens is emails, uh, voicemails, text messages become discoverable if there is litigation down, down the line. So once the investigation takes place, document, document, document but those conversations should generally be taking place in person or over the phone. Uh, remember to contact your insurer if anything comes up. There are sometimes reporting requirements and you have to do that within a certain period of time. You should be working with your staff to figure out how to notify parents of the allegation. Uh, not just how, but if, when, uh, when the time is right. There's a lot that can go into that. And then, you know, this is a little plug for us because this is what we do, but generally have counsel approve your actions 
one of the things that drives me nuts is when I get called four days after the police show up and said, oh, well, we did X, Y, and Z. And I'm thinking, oh, I would have told you not to do X, Y, and Z. So having those conversations up front can be really important. Uh, I'm up against my time, so I'm going to hit the last four super quick. Leasing space. A lot of times, if you, for example, have a nonprofit that you incorporate it as a separate entity, or if you work with a group like the Y to host uh, a preschool at your church, you should have a lease in place. It should be a written lease. There should be some indemnity language in there. Uh, I get a lot of questions about what's called UBIT or unrelated business income tax. Basically, churches saying, hey, if we're getting lease payments and getting rent from the preschool, do we have to pay taxes on that? Generally, the answer is no, unless you hold a mortgage on your building. And then you may have some tax implications. You may think, well, that sounds dumb. Yeah, it is. But you should be talking to your accountant or your lawyer to figure out whether you have those tax implications so the IRS uh, doesn't come knocking. Um, like I said, we've seen an uptick in parents threatening lawsuits over vaccine policies, sharing or not sharing information, calling teachers to, uh, to testify during divorce cases. It gets really tricky. Again, not to toot our own horn, but we deal with this a lot. Um, I would not allow my teachers to be working with counsel or working with parents that have threatened a lawsuit. I know that has to happen sometimes, but generally that's a good indication that you ought to bring counsel in to be working with these parents. Photographs on social media, I'm sure you've all heard, don't put last names on there. I will say if you have not gone to uh, training on social media policies, uh, it is one of the grossest trainings in the world because uh, if you do this long enough, you will find photographs that go to social media that find themselves in dark, dark places of the internet that you would never expect. And it turns my stomach just to say that, but to have those conversations with parents and to say, hey, these pictures are out there, there's nothing we can do about, it is a really terrible position to be in. So make sure that, uh, that you have a good policy in place that's communicated with parents. And then volunteer requirements. This is where I see a lot of schools slip up. They have volunteers that wanna come in and help with something. That's great, volunteers are wonderful. Volunteers still need to be vetted to make sure that they understand the policies, that you've done those background che checks, especially if they're working with children. Um, so that was way more information than, uh, than you can probably ingest in 20 minutes. Uh, a lot of the questions that you might have, we'll try to answer, but also most of this was to get you thinking about, okay, what do we need to do? Um, a lot of this stuff you can reach out to us and we can help with. You can reach out to attorneys that you might have in your congregation or on your staff. Um, I'll go through some questions now, but uh, for now, I'm really pleased to hand things over to Alex to talk about some education related considerations. Thank you, Jordan, I appreciate it. That was a really helpful overview to start off our session. So let me give a little bit of a roadmap for this particular section related to education related considerations. First, we're gonna go through things to consider as you go about choosing a vision. This involves making important decisions like selecting the type of school you wanna run and the education philosophy you wanna use. Then we're going to switch gears a little bit and discuss how to create a united vision. Sometimes faith communities and nonprofits who see a need for a preschool or a childcare program don't wanna tackle this type of an immense project alone. So they find another partner in their local community like Jordan talked about earlier, um, that's also interested in joining this journey. In this second section, we'll dive into some important items to note when the daycare or preschool is in a joint venture specifically. And then lastly, in the education section, we'll talk about how to make the vision come to life. We'll discuss key items that should be included in the business plan, which ultimately becomes sort of your action plan, your marching orders. So let's pivot to my first poll question. And under this new technology software, I wanna make sure everyone knows, um, you have to actually click the answer within the slide itself, um, as opposed to before where via Zoom or something else, it, it would pop out at you. We are now embedded into the system. And so you actually have to click the slide itself. Uh, where are you in the process of opening a preschool or childcare program? You are just thinking about it. You are going to do it and have consulted experts on it. You have started drafting a business plan. You are in the process of executing the business plan or you have an operational preschool or childcare program. And we'll wait a few seconds for those responses to trickle in. It looks like we have about a quarter of you who have responded. So I'll 
wait a little bit longer. Hopefully we weren't minimized and you're, you're turning it around. Great, we'll clo close the poll in five, four, three, two, and one. Let's see those results. So it looks like about 39%, almost 40% are thinking about it. You're not yet in the consulting and expert or the business plan, certainly not executing on a business plan phase. We have about 1% of you, maybe one person um, who you're going to do it, you've consulted an expert, but haven't yet developed that business plan. 0% of you fit into that middle category, um, those two middle categories. And then we have about the vast majority, almost 60%, who have an operational preschool or childcare program. So we're gonna cover all of these different areas, which is really helpful sort of from a benchmarking standpoint to see where our audience is. I'm a former third grade public school teacher, so I always like to first see where my audience sits on any given topic, where everyone fits to make sure that the presentation is most successful. So this is really helpful for, for us. So one of the first items you should consider is the type of school you wish to operate. There are various types of schools that a non-governmental entity can choose to operate. This includes the following type of schools, charters, private religious, private non-religiously affiliated, and we'll discuss each of these in the next couple slides. So let's first talk about the private religious school. A private religious school is a private entity with a religious affiliation that is not funded by a state or a federal government entity. A private religious school charges fees for students to attend typically, but it may have these fees offset by an affiliation with a church or other religious body. Private religious schools are more, more autonomous from state education agencies than charter schools, for example. However, if the school is affiliated or partnered with a church, the curriculum will likely have to comply with the church's mission and will likely have different requirements than a private non-religiously affiliated school, which we'll cover in the next slide. In some states, keep in mind, private schools are not required to be accredited and private school teachers are not required to be certified, but it's really important to know your state law on that particular issue. So next we'll move to the private non-religious schools. A private non-religiously affiliated school, also known as a traditional private school, is not funded by a state or federal government and is not affiliated with a religion, a parish, church, synagogue. A private non-religiously affiliated school typically charges fees for students to attend. And because there is no such affiliation, it doesn't have those fees offset by an affiliation with a church or other religious body. Therefore, the cost of attending a private non-religiously affiliated school is often higher than a private religious school. That's just typically from a benchmarking standpoint. Private non-religiously affiliated schools are more autonomous from the state education agencies than charter schools and are more autonomous than private religiously affiliated schools because they're not affiliated or associated with a religious institution. Next, we'll move on to charter schools. Uh, charter schools are independent public schools and are free from some of the rules and regulations that apply to traditional public schools. As a result, charter schools operate through contracts with an authorizer. A charter school authorizes, authorizers can include a local school district or the state authorizing office. Charter schools have more autonomy than traditional public schools. So for example, a charter school can have a special focus in the field of art or technology, math, science, things like that. Uh, additionally, charter schools can more freely design a school culture that provides students with motivation, discipline, guidance. Charter schools like traditional public schools are typically free for students to attend. However, in some circumstances, states permit open enrollment for charter schools to charge tuition for pre-kindergarten programs. Um, charter schools, unlike traditional public schools, require students to apply for entry into the school. In some states, open enrollment charter schools must use a common admission application. So again, something to keep in mind depending on what state you're, lo you're locally operating in. Finally, um, those are sort of the three main categories that we're going to cover um, related to all the different types um, and what, what sort of may be within your vision. Now, in terms of choosing a vision, um, this is not an exhaustive list in terms of what the educational philosophies are, um, but here are some that we've seen and helped advise schools on in terms of identifying what matches with their vision and what will be best for their student population and their community. 
an educational philosophy focuses on the big picture, how students should learn and how teachers should teach to maximize the student's potential. A curriculum is a specific set of tools and programming that a school employs to maximize that potential desire um, by that educational philosophy. So we'll discuss each of these types of philosophies because I know we have, just based on the attendee list, folks covering all across the board. So let's first dive into Montessori philosophy. Um, though the curriculum she establishes for students of all ability levels, Montessori philosophy was originally developed by Dr. Maria Montessori while she worked with special needs students. Um, Montessori philosophy believes in following the children, letting the children choose what they want to learn and having the teacher guide that learning. Because of this belief, Montessori is characterized by hands-on and student-directed learning. You'll see that as one of the themes, whether it's student-directed or teacher-directed. Um, this translates into an emphasis on student choice and independence, respect for the student's needs for order in their daily routines, and respect for the student's natural development. A typical Montessori classroom will have students of varying ages, learning materials within the student's reach, and working in spaces for independent and group work, both a combination of those, those two. Montessori schools are not required but encouraged um, to have a Montessori trained teacher at each appropriate age level for each class. And next, we'll talk about the Waldorf philosophy. This philosophy is based on Rudolf Steiner's theory of child development. The Waldorf theory uses a teacher-directed approach in the classroom and traditional academic subjects like math, reading, and writing are taught later um, than under other curricula. The Waldorf schools use a structure that is predictable for students while exploring areas that are not considered core subjects by mainstream public schools, such as gardening and wood carving. The goal is to ultimately provide students with experiences that allow them to independently and creatively approach problems. Let's move on to the next category. This is sort of a more general category of learner-centered philosophy. A learner-centered philosophy was developed in part by John Dewey, Jean Piaget, Carl Rogers, and Lev Yavitsky, who studied how children learn and how children are motivated. It focuses on each student's ability to challenge themselves through student-driven activities rather than through teacher-driven activities. The content in learner-centered philosophies is dictated by student questions and curiosity rather than by teacher lessons, homework, or traditional testing. It also encourages communities of learners where students work together to develop skills. Like the student, like the, excuse me, like the subject-centered philosophy, if you choose to adopt a learner-centered philosophy, you will need to find a curriculum for each specific subject area. So next we're gonna to move to the subject-centered philosophy. And this philosophy is the oldest and most frequently used philosophy in curricula nationwide. A subject-centered philosophy was likely developed during ancient Roman and Greek times in the Middle Ages. This type of philosophy is typically used in public schools. This is the one that most of us, when we think of the type of curriculum philosophy, this is what we're thinking of. Therefore, parents who opt not to send their children to public schools are frequently seeking alternatives from this type of curriculum. Uh, this philosophy focuses on teachers who are the subject experts, teaching students core subjects that all students should know at specific age uh, levels. No certification exists for this type of curriculum. And unlike Montessori or the Waldorf curricula, if you choose to adopt a subject-centered philosophy, you'll need to find a curriculum for each subject area. Next, we're going to turn to the broad field philosophy. This combines related fields into one broader field of study. This philosophy's goal is to emphasize relationships between the subjects and to integrate the learning experiences across subjects rather than compartmentalizing subjects. One drawback to keep in mind with this approach is often decreased depth in individual subject areas. At least that's the feedback that we've received. Um, like the last three philosophies, this philosophy does not require teachers or schools to be certified um, in the broad field curriculum because no such certification exists. Uh, furthermore, you'll need to find a curriculum that emphasizes this type of learning if that's the type that you end up adopting. 
The next philosophy that we'll cover is known as the activity or experience philosophy. This has a long history, but it's not generally known until about the 1920s, at least in terms of a historical perspective in education policy and law. It focuses on how students learn from their social and emotional environments in the classroom and uses activity as a means for learning and developing new skills. Like the prior two, activity or experience philosophy does not require teachers or schools to be certified in that particular curricula because no such certification exists. You'll need to find a curriculum for each subject area in order to adopt this particular philosophy. So before we move on, we want to make sure you've been grasping these concepts. So we'll have another poll question for you. Um, and I know we have folks from all across the country, which is so wonderful. And part of that, uh, we have to ask poll questions in order for you to get your CLE uh, notification and to make sure that you're still listening and we're not minimized on that screen. Um, so we will, we will ask the question, offer an opportunity for you to answer, and then go over those results. So here's how our poll question reads. If you wanted to start a child care program that emphasized the relationship between different academic subjects, which of the following philosophies would be most appropriate? The Montessori philosophy, the Waldorf philosophy, a subject-centered philosophy, the learner-centered philosophy, broad field philosophy, or the activity experience philosophy? And we'll wait a few seconds for those results to come in. I see the results slowly trickling in, which is great. It looks like we have about half of you who have responded. So we'll wait a few more seconds. Wonderful. I feel like as I say those results, uh, folks are making sure to submit their answers. And hopefully you're seeing what we meant earlier by, by the fact that the slides are now embedded, the poll questions are embedded within the slide. Okay, we will close those polls and check out the results. Okay. So it looks like we have about 12% of you that answered Montessori philosophy, 6% that said the Waldorf philosophy, 36% said the subject-centered philosophy, 9% said the learner-centered philosophy. It looks like a quarter of you said the broad field philosophy and 12% said the activity or experience philosophy. Here, the correct an answer actually is in that 25% or 24.6%, that broad field philosophy. Remember, that's an area that we don't, we don't see as often used. And that's why we, uh, my amazing colleague who helped me put together some of these slides, Kimberly Gutierrez, shout out to you and Madison. Um, when, when we put together these slides, we wanted to highlight that one because that isn't a commonly known type of philosophy within education. Um, and so because of that, I wanna make sure we cover it. So, so here, the broad field philosophy, like we talked about earlier, it combines related subjects into one broader field of study, emphasizing relationships between those subjects. Um, but there may be sort of a, a lack of depth in any individual given subject area. So that's one thing to sort of keep in mind as, as, uh, as you're deciding which, which philosophy to choose. Okay, so let's now talk about when you're actually choosing a vision um, and what type of programs uh, can be often for, offered. First, you wanna consider offering programs in language aside from English. Being bilingual is a benefit in almost every industry and can open doors for a better future. Um, when deciding on a language teaching model, you may consider a one or two way model. In a one way model, you would teach the students in the target language for more than 80% of the time, even core subjects. In a two way model, model, you would teach in English 50% of the time and in the target language the other 50% of the time. If you would like to teach in a language other than English, it's important that you think through how you will merge that choice with your educational philosophy. Something to keep in mind. You may also want you may also be considering having religion play a role in your preschool or childcare program. If you choose to have religion play a part, you should consider the extent that religion will be a part of the curriculum. Uh, there are other benefits to having religion to be part of your school. For example, the church may be able to advertise at other local 
other locations and help drive students to your school. Um, they may also be able to financially support the school like Jordan dove much more in depth on that topic during his section. Um, if the preschool or child care program is operated under the religious entity's exclusive control, it may likely qualify as a license exempt entity under state law, again, depending on what, what state you're in. However, if a religious organization enters an arrangement with a non-religious organization for the maintenance or operation of the child care facility, then the facility is no longer considered under the exclusive control of the religious organization. Um, therefore, the religious entity will likely not be able to cl claim a religious organization license exemption and will be required to obtain a license for the daycare. Things to keep in mind as you're creating that vision and, and licensing considerations. I see I'm running up on time. So all of our slides are available and I wanna make sure that Michaela has a wonderful opportunity to talk about the employment considerations. A few highlights since I see some folks in the attendee list um, who have these entities um, and these legal arrangements, these legal formations. Um, things to think about when you're creating your childcare or daycare facility is whether you want to engage in an MOU or a services agreement, whether your partnership or um, engagement will include one of those. Here are some considerations to keep in mind um, as you're developing that. Um, also, whether you wanna create a joint venture or a separate nonprofit entity um, joint venture. Again, these are all considerations as you're developing sort of the legal formation of your specific preschool or child care center. Now, making your mission statement, this is a really critical piece that I think a lot of folks think about in the beginning, before even they get to the legal formation, before they even get to thinking about the educational philosophy. And so you want, you want to make sure that you revisit it at this phase too. Who are you? What makes your daycare or child care facility unique? Who do you plan on serving and in what way? Um, I think that that's going to be really important um, as you develop that business plan and that you you know, as you're talking to donors and things like that, that are part of your community. There are also some financial aspects that are important and I, I would be remiss if we didn't cover them. So I wanna make sure I, I dive into that as well. Um, you should think through a sales forecast, which typically includes spe specific projections for at least the first three fiscal or academic years of your school. The sales forecast should include detailed discussions on the bases for your forecasting and whether there are any assumptions you made in preparing your forecast. Next, you should consider the sources of your income this should account for the various ways that your school plans to generate income to maximize profits and ensure your long-term sustainability. For example, think through the pricing strategy that you plan to employ, if you plan to employ one, um, to generate income from the students and think through who could be potential donors. Um, when thinking through employment, it's important to discuss how it will be carried out, how employees will be paid, whether they will be paid more if they have more experience in your plan for retaining faculty and staff. Finally, sustainability and expansion discussions should address common pitfalls to the long-term success of non-traditional schools. Sustainability and expansion should not just consider student enrollment, but also faculty and staff retention. I often see that as sort of the overlooked piece within, within this entire framework of developing and having a successful preschool and childcare facility, which I think is a beautiful prelude to my colleague who's going to talk about sort of the employment side of operating a childcare or a preschool facility. I'll turn it over to you, Michaela. Thanks, Alex, and also thanks, Jordan. First of all, as you can tell from my voice, I'm a little nasally, so I'm one of the one of the two individuals with a little bit of a head cold, so I apologize for that, but I'm excited to be joining everyone today. So as Alex mentioned, we're gonna be looking at general employment guidance for nonprofits, specifically with a focus on religious employers. While advising employers, we often notice that there is a higher employee turnover rate at daycare or preschool programs whether it be affiliated with a religious entity or not. At times, it's an easy separation of employment. Both the individual, the individual and the employer go their separate ways. But other times, the employment separation can turn into a legal dispute. We therefore should consider how to prepare for these potential employment legal matters arising from daycare programs. Today, we'll focus on the doctrine of ministerial exception, as Jordan mentioned, 
and then discuss how to best position an employee of the daycare program to be considered a minister under the law. As Jordan mentioned, the business formation for the child care programs can and does impact how an employee of a child care program is legally classified. In the employment world, whether the child care program is considered a separate entity or one with the church can shape the legally cognizable defenses that may arise in an employment dispute. Courts often look to three main um, factors, employment policies such as employee handbooks, the management structure, so whether the daycare providers all report to some, some core entity in the church, and then finances. Obviously, the more intertwined the church and the child care program are, the better when considering the doctrine of the ministerial exception. So let's talk about the ministerial exception. As many of you know, a grieved employee can bring local, state, and federal claims against their employers. Today, we'll focus on the federal law, but states and local law have also adopted, adopted these same principles and laws. Under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, employers are prohibited from discriminating against an individual based on race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. And as the names imply under the Age Discrimination Act and the American Disabilities Act, both of these statutes prohibit discrimination based on age and disability. For religious employers, however, they are granted an additional defense to employment claims that other employers are not awarded. This defense is called the ministerial exception. Under the ministerial exception, employment discrimination suits are barred if brought by an employee of a religious employer who qualifies as a minister. The ministerial exception is a legal defense, and as framed by the Supreme Court, religious institutions have a discretion over whom they employ as ministers pursuant to the First Amendment. A common mistake we often see when we're advising churches is the limitation on who is considered a minister. So let's look at who is considered a minister in your entities. The ministerial exception is not limited to a head of a religious congregation. And that is important. When we're often advising, we see our clients asking, well, they're not a minister. And it's not as black and white as looking at just the title of the individual. There's no rigid test, but recent holdings coming down from the Supreme Court and other cases shed light on who is defined as a minister. For example, in a trailblazing case known as Asani Tabor, the Supreme Court found a teacher was a minister. In a similar case, known as Our Lady of Guadalupe School, the Supreme Court held an elementary school teacher at a religious school qualified as a minister. And they based this holding off of the duties of the teacher. They said the teacher performed vital religious duties. So what are vital religious duties? These have included, but are not limited to educating and informing students in the religious doctrine. Also conducting worship services or religious ceremonies and rituals such as prayers or daily devotionals, as well as serving as a messenger or teacher of the faith. Importantly, however, I wanna note that religious duties do not have to be what makes up most of the workers' time. In Hassani Tabor, the Supreme Court said that a teacher who led a 15-minute devotional out of her six-hour instructional day was a minister under the law. The teacher also incorporated, to the extent applicable, the church's teachings in subject matter. This level, this mere level of religious activity was sufficient to support the application of the ministerial exception. And so any of those employment claims brought by that teacher were barred by the ministerial exception defense. 
I think the best way to understand the ministerial exception is to look at a recent case holding that came down from the New Jersey District Court just a few months ago. And this is called Victoria Cristello versus St. Teresa School. There, a Catholic church terminated the employment of an unmarried pregnant teacher. This was an art teacher. She taught art um, to many different students. Ultimately, the teacher sued under the state's employment discrimination law, specifically pregnancy discrimination. In its defense, the church argued that the teacher breached its code of conduct by engaging in sex outside of marriage. Therefore, the church argued the termination was justified and permitted under the ministerial exception. The court agreed with the church's argument. The court found that the teacher was a minister and the ministerial exception applied. In support of this holding, the church relied on three main pieces of evidence. And I've had those outlined in front of you. But first, the court found that the art teacher signed a document at the beginning of her employment that said she would uphold the code of ethics adopted by the archdiocese. Second, the art teacher also signed a supplemental document that said she understood the fundamental mission of the church for all personnel was to exhibit the highest ethical standards. Lastly, the art teacher acknowledged that sex outside of marriage violated the church's core tenets. Though the art teacher did not educate students in the religious doctrine or conduct worship services, the court found that these three acknowledgments by the art teacher were enough to consider the art teacher a minister. Therefore, the church could not be held liable under the New Jersey discrimination laws for pregnancy discrimination. This brings us to recommendations on how to position your employees, specifically an employee in the daycare program, to be legally considered as a minister. And obviously, as you've seen, if you can position your employee to be a minister under the law, it's recommended. It's easy to see that an employee with the formal title, title of pastor, bishop, or the like will tend to fall under the ministerial exception. But courts often and most importantly weigh the job duties in applying the ministerial exception or not. Based on the examples we provided, we recommend that employers seeking to apply the ministerial exception to a, to a position do the following. First, update internal documents such as employee handbooks to reflect the institution's religious mission. Second, ensure employees have explicit religious duties. For example, religious instruction, feeding prayer, daily devotionals, or any of the like. The job description is also something that a lot of employers overlook. And this is one of the most important documents I tend to look to when I'm trying to classify an individual as a minister under the law. The document should expressly state that the employee is required to contribute to the institution's religious mission and any of those religious goals or job responsibilities should also be set up for in that job description. Another consideration is to tie performance reviews to religious standards, such as modeling the faith in their personal daily interactions. Lastly, the qualifications or learning opportunities are also relevant when considering whether the, whether the ministerial exception applies. A religious entity can better position itself to take advantage of the ministerial exception if it requires its employees to have or to pursue some sort of theological or ministry related experience or degree. This can be as simple as completing a Bible study course or class in the church's doctrine or actually having a theological degree. There is no question that if you can position an employee to be considered a minister, you should do that in the chance of an employment discrimination claim arising. And religious entities that proactively design and shape staff positions with these factors in mind are more likely to benefit from this ministerial exception. 
going to turn this right back to Jordan to close us out, but thank you for letting me join you guys today. Thanks very much, Michaela. Uh, for those following along at home, uh, the good news is I hit the nail on the head with my overdose of cold medicine, and I got about 20 good minutes, and, and, and you got it, so that, that was great. Um, I've been monitoring questions that come in. I'm gonna give two quick answers, or really non-answers, unfortunately, uh, just kind of based on what we've seen coming in. The, the first is really unfortunate and a sign of our times that I had multiple questions about uh, threats of violence against a faith community, specifically a synagogue. Um, first, I will say that my hearts go out to all of you. Uh, I can't imagine, that is terrible. But as far as providing guidance on how to respond to that, it's really hard to do. Uh, it, it, it is something that, that, that we do regularly, working with faith communities and schools uh, in response to threats of violence, but it's hard to compress that into 30 seconds at the end of a webinar. So I've reached out to the, some of you. If others have specific questions, feel free to reach out to us after the webinar and, and we can uh, have that discussion. Uh, the second, I had some questions about tax issues, particularly tax issues if a church preschool doesn't really focus on religious uh, teaching or, or religious education. Generally, what I can tell you is I, I have not really seen any pushback from the IRS. Um, I, I don't think they're they're uh, coming in at the 87,000 new agents or anything or are looking at churches to see, uh, check on the curriculum that is being taught. One thing that I will say that we have seen is state and county tax authorities um, pushing back on churches that host preschools or other, um, or other um, uh, organizations like that that may be paying rent or, or tuition coming in like that. And maybe it's just that states are, are eager for some more uh, tax revenue coming in, but we've seen uh, a lot of county tax assessors trying to um, collect property taxes from church buildings when they have things like preschools in the buildings. And, and we've been retained to push back against that from time to time. Hopefully it's not something that you are seeing. Uh, however, if it comes up, feel free to reach out to attorneys, accountants, uh, tax professionals to push back on that. It is still rare at this point in time, uh, but it does uh, pop up from time to time. I think, I think that's what we got. Um, I'm checking through things now. There may be a couple other questions that are more specific that we'll respond to via email, but I do really just want to say thank you to Michaela, to Alex, to those on the staff here at, at uh, Hush Blackwell that helped put this on, and to all of you for attending. Hopefully each of you is walking away either uh, with some great knowledge uh, about the preschool that you have or that you may be uh, forming. Hopefully we didn't scare you off uh, from, from forming uh, a, a preschool and, and, and engaging in that mission or ministry. So again, uh, just as a reminder, the program has been approved for legal education hours. So click on the CEU icon at the bottom of the screen uh, to report your hours. Uh, certificate of attendance, including course numbers, will be in your email inbox tomorrow, along with a recording of the webcast. Feel free to share uh, to others in your organization or in your network. And finally, like I said uh, at the beginning, please feel free to complete our short survey, particularly if there are topics that you would like to see uh, be the focus of a webinar, that's how we got this one. Um, so feel free to throw those out there and we'll do what we can to address them. That concludes our webinar. Thank you all so much. Have a great day.